We're going to take a cue off of Jocko. The inspiring true story of Corey Ten Boom, a Dutch watchmaker whose heroic efforts saved the lives of hundreds of Jews during World War II at tremendous cost to herself and her family. We're going to be talking about the watchmaker's daughter today. And I'm Emma Darren. Larry. Larry is a New York Times bestselling author and a whole ton of other awesome books in his repertoire. Larry, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are y'all? Ah, uh, this is fun. This doing is great. Fantastic. I love. It. Good job. Yeah, we, yeah. Good job with the love, intro. Thanks. We love talking nonfiction books. We do love our thrillers. We do love our thrillers, and man, we've talked to a ton of awesome thriller authors. Once yeah, in a while, know, but my my genre, what I essentially created, is nonfiction thrillers. So all my press stuff that goes out, the press release, everything says nonfiction thriller author. And that's what usually comes in the reviews. The reviews for all the books always say reads more like a thriller, uh, which is what I wanted because I, I like thrillers and, it, and it's more fun to read that way. And, you know, that's one of the things I really I'm really going to enjoy reading this is because I love reading thriller books, but I always like to get something out of books. Right. So if you're reading a really good fiction thriller and you have an author that knows what he's talking about, it gets the tech specs in there and you can look at things a different way. But when you're now talking about nonfiction thriller, it's like real. I love real life thrillers. Yeah. So I'm really excited about this. And The Watchmaker's Daughter, and I love I love history books, but I love learning history through a different lens, especially like when you have a really strong protagonist. Mm -hmm. it, this is really cool, Larry. You've kind of jumped into a, a neat a niche you know, strong characters in a fiction and a nonfiction thriller genre. How do you come up with this type of, how do you find a, a story that's going to be able to captivate a reader? Yeah. Good for question. So long? It, it's difficult, uh, you know, because when I started out, I started researching into the lion's mouth back in like 2012. And I, obviously everybody knows what a biography is and everybody knows what a thriller is, but I really wanted to write a nonfiction thriller. And the problem or the hurdle that I always have is if you're going to write about a real person in history, they can't just do one or two cool, fun or dangerous things. There has to be a whole menu of them because you can write, you have to write a whole book. So you have chapter after chapter after chapter and good thrillers have cliffhangers, you know, every other chapter and then mystery and misdirection and all the things that are involved in the nuances of just writing in that genre. So the difficulty for me is always to find an agent, to find someone that didn't, you know, wasn't a one trick pony, did one thing. Um, they have to have a lot of stuff that they've done. And so for every book, this is my fourth one. Now Watchmaker Star is number four. For all of them that I've done, I've, I've discarded probably five potential people, five potential subjects for every one that I've done because they don't pan out. There, there's not enough stuff. Yeah, they did one cool thing, one brilliant thing, one dangerous thing, um, and that was it. So that's my uh, my hurdle, is to to find somebody where there's just stuff going on all the time, and they did a lot of crazy stuff. Is that why you selected World War II and it for your time frame, because that seems to be the theme also. Well, I've always been interested in World War II because it's like the only event in history that was truly worldwide. I mean, the whole world, um, virtually every country was involved. So that makes it exciting. I was a political science major in college, so I studied, you know, history. But uh, I've just been fascinated by World War II. And there's it's so much drama and stories between Hitler and Himmler and Goering and Churchill and Roosevelt and all the great players, you know, uh, Patton and 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 Rommel and Montgomery. I mean, where what other time in history do you have all these exciting players? And so, what I'm bringing to the table are people that you don't know about that were did a lot of cool, crazy, exciting things. So, you know, I talked to one of my buddies who's a, th a thriller author, and he was like, you know, you have to have seven or eight different conflicts within the book. And it's true, like when you're looking at a nonfiction book, once in a while I get one or two, but to keep that story flowing, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. 
Yeah, in fact, the um, I think it was Kirkus Reviews back when I wrote Codename Lease. They they put in the reviewer at Kirkus put in there every chapter ends in a cliffhanger for the whole book. And I was fortunate because a lot of stuff happened between her and her her uh, partner there, uh, Peter Churchill. They, there was just something going on all the time where one of them almost died or was almost captured. They had a they had a a, a German secret agent chasing them around France. So um, so anyway, that that's what I look for when I'm looking for stories. That's an excellent point. You never really think of it from that perspective. We know World War II was. And it was life changing for so many, and it still is. But when you put it like that, you never really think about how grand of a story it really was. And now to take little facets of that, that is really, really interesting. Uh, have you considered going into any other time frames, or are you going to stick with World War II for a while? No, my agent told me to stay in my lane. So <laughs> I, I had hinted at it once, and he said, absolutely not you have to stay in your lane you're in world war ii for which is fine with me because i like it um so that's my i that's uh, my genre forever when i when i picture world war ii and protagonists and everything i always think of indiana jones like the plane the plane's going from here to there to everywhere else and it's, it's just there's so much i love history and between the 20s and the 50s there's so much in there and that's because you got to remember the protagonists that a lot of them were born in that that the whole spectrum of time frame mm -hmm. and to get them. And then all of a sudden the whole world is at war, the whole entire world. Yeah, there's there's yeah. such characters there. And, you know, I mentioned some of the exciting people like Churchill and Rommel and, and Montgomery and so forth in um, in uh, which book was it? Um, Peter or. Uh, Winston Churchill, this was in, in the lion's mouth, Winston Churchill has to go to an intelligence meeting. This is April, right before D-Day. And he reads, and I had to order these. It's difficult. You can get archives from different places, but if you want Ian Fleming's archives, which is what I was at, I mean, I wanted all in my five, all in my six, but in particular, I wanted Ian Fleming's. They're kept in a safe. They're not in the main place. They're kept locked up in a safe. You have to buy, you have to buy all of them. But, and they come in sheets like like this big. And uh, anyway, one, one of them that I that I got, I'm reading, and it's Ian Fleming's reports back to his boss, Godfrey, right before the right right before D-Day. Um, but anyway, in in this stack of all these archives, I've got a, a memo um, that is a intelligence briefing and an MI5 intelligence because MI5 handled all the double agents and the whole this is what winston churchill read and this was his april uh it was produced in april so he's reading it in in may i guess uh, right before d-day and the whole thing is about my guy tricycle it doesn't say his real name that's his code name tricycle and it goes through how he's he's convinced the germans that you know we're attacking later it's not going to be at, at at normandy it's going to be at calais He's he's convinced them it's going to be in June. And oh, by the way, he swindled eighty thousand dollars out of them, which will fund our budget. I mean, all these things that are buried in, in an archive. And and so I'm reading this. I'm like, you have this is what Churchill was reading, you know, that that day about. about so he knew who Popoff was. He knew who my guy was. So for for all of these, I just I just like finding these little nuggets. It's like an Easter egg hunt. You go out and. You find a bunch of rocks, but occasionally you find some gold. So um, that's just part of the enjoyment of me doing the research side of it. Well, the research, the research. I mean, coming from your background, you know, you said you were a lawyer, and that's it's all research, you know, and it's it's you finding specific parts of the law and historical law and everything you can do to bring your case. Yeah, well, it's, it, it, it's it's great. It's actually, and I because I there there are a lot of lawyers. Um, some write fiction, by the way. John Grisham, you know, he used yeah, to be a lawyer. Oh, of course, yeah. He, <laughs> out, he used to be a lawyer. Um, but what helped me the, more than anything was law review because you can go to law school but not really know how to do hardcore, intense 
research um, that where every literally every line in a law review article has to be footnoted. You have to say where the source came from, and they're going to be checked. I mean, we, basically in law school, you're talking about cases, but you have to you have to learn how every statement of fact you make has to have a footnote to say where that came from in case a judge or a law professor wants to go check it. And so that's where I, that's how I was trained. So my books always have huge section of end notes um, and bibliographies because that's, that's what I'm used to doing. And I want people to, to understand it's not my opinion. If it's in the book, it, it's verifiable and you can go to the end notes and read where it came from. All the dialogue that's in all of my books came right out of primary sources. I don't make up any dialogue. Um, no quotes that I put it in. It's all directly from primary sources. See, now that's really interesting too, but how challenging did you find it? Because, you know, spies, espionage, I mean, they intentionally obfuscate things. You know, things are omitted yeah. intentionally and then you have the reports with need to let know. I, yeah. How frustrating was it to try to figure out where to fill in your holes? Well, you come in with the assumption that, first of all, everything's classified when these guys are operating. And after they get out, it's still classified. So for all of my books, none of the people could write about what they had done because they're all under under what they sign, you know, oath, that they cannot reveal anything. And then so all of the World War II stuff was classified. And so not until the early 80s, uh, that it starts coming, things start becoming unclassified, declassified. Um, and that opens up what I can access because now I'm either going to the National Archives here at College Park, uh, Maryland National Archives too, or the UK at Q, that's where their National Archives are. So that allows me to find out absolutely what really happened. Like in Popoff, he, he had written a biography, an autobiography, and he had to change every name. He had to change all the names. And he had to change some of the places and change some, because he doesn't want to get in trouble, you know, for, for what he's writing. Uh, Ian Fleming had to do this, even though he was writing fiction. In fact, he got in trouble from MI5. They almost sued him uh, because the Enigma machine he had called Spectra or something like that. And they thought it was too close. You know, he, he had not been authorized to do that. And they decided not to sue him only because it would have drawn more attention to it. So all these spies have to sign these things. And so not until stuff is declassified, do you even find out what happened? But who, who goes, to, you know, who says, OK, today, let's take a field trip to to College Park, Maryland and just kind of walk through the, the, you know, the million files in the archives. No one does that. So you this, have to have a reason to be there. Well, with the watchmaker's daughter, too, if you're talking about a Dutch spy and Dutch spy syndicate, I mean, that must be tough with the language barrier and to try to pull the archives for that. Well, she wasn't a spy. She was, and this is the first one that, that I've done that wasn't a spy. Okay. She was in the in the Dutch resistance. So she and her family and their and their home there, they hid Jews and they also hid what are called Dutch divers, which are Dutch boys here between like 16 to 35. If the if the Germans caught you on the street, they would just snatch you and send you off to a German factory, you know, typically never to be heard from again. So they hid both. They, they hid both of these two groups of people. Um, but she was not a spy. In fact, the only person, the, the person that actually started them in down this track was a guy by the name of Hans Poli, who was an 18 year old university student who had to hide because he's 18. He's you know, they, they'll snatch him off the street. And he decided he wanted to help the war effort. So he decided to go into the Dutch resistance, which was all underground, of course, and he became a courier, which means he had to dress as a girl. So he had to put on the wig and the dress and all that, get on a bicycle. And so um, anyway, he was the one that goes back to Corey one day and says, oh, by the way, I, I joined the French, I, I joined the Dutch resistance. And I, and I have to take, because this brings more danger to you and everybody in the house, because if I'm caught being involved with the resistance was a capital crime. Uh, they had given him a gun and told him, which, by the way, was also a capital crime to have a gun. And they said, OK, we want you to shadow this Gestapo agent because we're thinking of taking him out, the Dutch resistance. So Hans Poli is shadowing this because either he or somebody else is going to kill him. So all anyway, so that's what kind of he, he told Corey all this. And she's like, well, we want to help. 
we use our use our home as the headquarters. This will be great. And and so that's how the family got pulled into this. So, you know, when you're talking about putting this information together, so Emma and I, I both have like the intel background, but then we also have like from the investigative standpoint, it's almost like writing, you know, like a timeline, like a chronography, you know, like, hey, how did this work? And then pulling all this information and putting it together. What's your research process like? Are you keeping us like, do you have like a big whiteboard? Do you have a board behind you with sticky if, notes? If, if How do you saw, keep it intact? <laughs> if you saw what I did and I, and I have to do it this way, I have an Excel spreadsheet and it literally goes day by day by day by day, uh, you know, basically from, I mean, I have to know when the person was born and all that stuff, but in terms of when the action really starts, I have to do every day and I, and I have to show what happened, where this, where that, where that came from in terms of the source. So I have a very long Excel spreadsheet that, that tracks that. And, and so when I'm doing research, if I find something, I have to go, oh, wait, that didn't happen on June 14. It happened on for example, in, in Popoff's memoir, he had said that they MI5 had this big party for him on um, as the bombs are falling on at, at D-Day on June 6th, which was not the case at all. I got the MI5 files and his case officer said, oh, we had a big party for Popoff on April 16th. So that's, I mean, a lot of people might say, well, what's not that much difference of time, it, but it's a difference. And I have to put what actually happened. So originally I would have had D-Day is when that happened. And then I have to change it. No, I found out a better source and, and it happened on April 16th. So I'm constantly going back and forth, changing dates and moving stuff around. Wow. So yeah, it, you and Excel are extremely good friends. And it's what I'm hearing. Yeah. You would cringe if you saw my Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> you would cringe. It's, it's very small because there's there, but fortunately Excel does not cut you off on a certain number of lines. So, so as soon as you said Excel, I died a little inside. I'm like, oh no. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty scary looking. Well, I am curious, like of all the stories that you could tell, like, don't get me wrong. I'm so glad that you chose like, you know, the spies and the, you know, kind of the more unsung heroes uh, from the time period. But there were a plethora of her heroes, heroines that you could have chosen. What made you go towards the espionage lilt uh, just in general um uh, because to me that's exciting i mean i grew up with james bond i mean sean connery was the coolest guy ever and so i for me sean connery was james bond and so i was a bond fan i like everybody else as a kid and then you know you're introduced i to, to ian fleming's novels and so forth uh, but i i've always just been fascinated tell you the truth i really wanted to be an intelligence officer like you guys and just never graduated to that so this is my out this you, you my never out. never say never <laughs> there's still yeah. time there's still time you could there's always be an fso time. foreign service officer or something they always yeah, want people go. you know <clears throat> you talk about sources and that is so critical when you're providing a non-fiction narrative and especially when you're providing any type of product so vetting these sources, I mean, like you said, you can come, one source is going to say this, one source is going to say this, yeah. putting them together. Yeah. That's tradecraft. I mean, that's intelligence, you know, and summarization. That's where right the, the, the general legal training helps too, because uh, lawyers have rules of evidence. You have to take a class, a, a, a five-hour class, a very long class in evidence. And because there's a rule, there are rules and there's a hierarchy on the credibility of evidence. And you have all of these rules and all of these exceptions. So, for example, um, what what is highly credible is a, a document that was done in the course of everyday routine work that was done at that time, signed at that time, and you know put in the file. That's very credible, uh, as opposed to what's not credible. Hearsay. There are all these rules on hearsay. So, if I pick up a magazine. Uh, and there's a quote from somebody, well, that's hearsay. I have to prove, you know, this quote. Or if someone says, well, Bill told John that, I, I have to prove that. I can't just go on the hearsay. I have to get a direct quote. Like, for example, um, somewhere in here my, in my books, Peter Churchill was Odette Sampson's organizer and, and boss while they were operating in France. 
and he wrote three memoirs. So for all of the quotes about him and what he said and what he did, I have to pull from his book, not what a prior biographer said, not what anybody else said. I have to pull it directly from the horse's mouth. And that's just my training as a lawyer dealing with the rules of evidence. That absolutely makes a, a lot of sense. And I think it, it comes through, like when you're doing a story about the, the watchmaker's daughter, in this case, I saw that you had to not only go with what you had available, but you were pulling from other stories and you actually did the research on like everyone else who's tried to tell this story. They only had little facets of it and then mm -hmm. things had been admitted. And so uh, I'm assuming that's where your Excel spreadsheet came in into play, where you were able to go through, oh, wait, nope, this needs to go here, here, yeah. here. Yeah. But that pays yeah. off. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's what I have to do for every book. And on all of my books, there, there's been a prior biography or autobiography, or in some cases, like Into the Lion's Mouth, there was both. But when I read them, I just knew this is not everything, that this is not all of the information. And again, I knew that I could access classified files now, too, which helped. But for example, with the watchmaker's daughter uh, in 1971, you know, 50 whatever years ago, uh, a couple, uh, it, uh, the Corey Tim Boom did not actually write that book. It was written by two professional writers, John and Elizabeth Sherrill, whose names are on the book. Um, but it only told, I mean, when I read it, I kind of figured this, it only told about 10% of the story. It didn't say any, this guy I told you about earlier, Hans Poli, he's not even in the, he's not even in the book. And he's the second most person, most important person in the story after Corey is this guy named Hans Poli who got them all involved in, in the Dutch resistance. Um, he's not even in there. And there's almost nothing on Peter Van Warden, Corey's nephew, uh, who was also involved in the Dutch resistance and wrote his own book. So these guys wrote their own books. That's not in there. And then all of the archives for Corey are in the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. So I had to go to Wheaton College and spend four days there just pouring through every single file, all of her passports, all of her letters, the stuff she wrote in prison, her scraps of paper from prison uh, when she was in Ravensbrook concentration camp. And it's just file after file, box after box. So it took me four days. So all of that, you know, I bring together all that because now I know what really happened. There's always, when you don't, <laughs> this may sound a little, a little bold, but it's almost like when you don't have a lawyer <laughs> gathering all this together, you have, mis you have mistakes because people just assume they don't have rules of evidence to apply to say, I can't count this. That has to come out. I can't trust this. So a lot of times there are things in, uh, for example, in The Princess Spy, uh, th there were incidents that I can't, like a murder, that I can't put in because I can't prove that it actually happened. If I can't prove that, it, you know, in fact, the, the particular murder that That's I'm speaking interesting. of, the, the, the Elaine Griffith did make it up. It's completely made up. Uh, the guy that was supposed to be the person that was, that was actually the, the murder, which she said was her later to be OSS co-agent. He wasn't even in the country for another six months. So he, he, he couldn't have been the killer. And there was, so, and I checked the newspapers, then it, she made it up. And so I had to leave it out. And, and, and sadly, the families don't know. The families just assume whatever's in the book that their father, grandfather, whoever wrote, that it's all accurate. And that's not the case. Um, I mean, Popoff made some mistakes. He didn't make anything up, but he made a couple mistakes that I had to correct. But Aileen Griffith, she, she, made, she made some stuff up uh and and so i had to cut all that out and and um i what i could prove or i had a very good sense of what applying again another legal standard beyond the shadow of a doubt beyond a, a reasonable doubt uh, there is another murder in there that i think happened and it was I, I know well i know that it happened because i found the sons of her partner in the coding room who were still alive and they said, hey, Larry, our dad wrote this thing for us, just he never published. He wrote a 100 page memoir about what he did during the war because he was a spy and he was her partner in the coding room. And he says, uh, you know, do you they said, do you want to read it? And I said, I'd love to read it. Send it to me. It's 100 pages, never published. 
Well, in there, because I was wondering about another murder that, that Aileen had said had happened, and, and, it, and it happened in her apartment. And I said, yeah, send this to me. So I start reading this, and lo and behold, I get to the line that says, which reminds me of the night that I removed a dead body from Aileen's apartment. He was the guy they called to remove the body and he had to wrap it up in a blanket and, wow. and literally make the body disappear in a foreign country. They're, they're in Spain, they're in Madrid. He has to get rid of this body in the middle of the night. Um, so had I not had that access, I, I wouldn't have put it in, but I, but I confirmed it by getting this never seen before hundred page memoir by the person who did it. And, and it's highly credible because he wasn't trying to make money off a book. This was for his family. No one else saw it. No one else has ever seen this thing. And so uh, that was. Uh, now you got was, me. You got me even more excited because I'm, I'm looking at this like, you know, as someone who's been like in the courtroom and testifying and understanding how the legal process works to able to get this in there and get the information in there a vetted book is much more than just a, a normal historical book where you're just pulling data off of everywhere. Right. You know, this is a very vetted book and a very vetted sources. I love it. I'm looking forward to the watchmaker's daughter. I think this might be my first one. And I'm going to have to backtrack and read the rest of your books, but I'm excited for this. The watchmaker's order is out now, everybody. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about all this stuff. Thanks. Well, I think everyone's going to need to kind of buckle up for it, too, because it's not just history. It, it, it is a thriller. I mean, I, I read just a little portion, you know, talking about 100 babies being rescued from being murdered by the Nazis. Right. And if, right. if that doesn't make you have an emotional response mm -hmm. to something that actually happened, you might want to check your pulse. So, yeah, there's there's danger. All I mean, that's that, that was life in the Netherlands during that time because they were occupied by the Nazis. And so they had stuff almost every night there's a german truck that pulls up a german army truck that pulls up outside their house one night and stays there right in front of their you know just feet from their front door so they all have freak out they have to scamper up the, the refugees have to dive into the hiding place and the place that they had created only holds a total of eight people standing up it's like a small closet uh, and they have to crawl through a little hole which they they had built in a linen closet at the very bottom was a trap door they would all crawl in. Um, and so four Jews and two resistance agents all had to scamper in there. Uh, well, this is actually on another raid, but raids were, raids and threat of raids were happening all the time. So they had a timer. One of the one of the Dutch divers that stayed there was an electrician. So he wired the whole house. He wired the whole house with warning buttons. And so in their watch shop in the bottom, by Corey's desk, by her dad's desk, and by the door, there was a little a secret button that they could push that would tell the upstairs, you know, the residentials upstairs on the next two floors that would tell them the Gestapo's here, we're having a raid, hide. And so they had, they had practiced how long it would take for everybody to scamper up into the, you know, on the third floor where Cora's room and where this hiding place was. And, and Cora was timing it. And she, it, she had them down to 70 seconds for all these people to get through. They had to flip their beds because the Gestapo would touch a bed to see if it was still warm. And so they had to flip all the beds oh, yeah. and they had to grab whatever stuff was in their room and run with them, whether it's a pipe, anything, and run into this hiding place, which is literally a very small closet. And um, and then once they got in, they would shut the trap door and then wait. And and one part of the story, when I maybe I shouldn't say, but they're trapped. One part of the story, they're trapped in there and they can't get out because there are German Gestapo agents in the bill in, in the house and they can't get out. And they've got no food, no water, no facilities, you know, no restrooms. So they uh, they had to improvise and it was it was not pretty. Um, but but that kind of stuff happened all the time in real life. Um, Hans Polish dad was was almost narrowly missed being executed um they were all arrested they were all interrogated uh it, it was just a, a daily nightmare for for them for four 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 years you know we look at we always look at world war ii with like this macro level we look at like the d-days we look at pearl yeah. harbor these are the stories that i like seeing written is because you want to know what 
almost like the user level. What's the ground truth? What are the people on the on the ground actually feeling? What are they going through? Yeah. We know what the troops at D-Day we went through kind of. I mean, we see the books, we see the right. movies, we read the books, we see the movies. It's over yeah. and over and over again. It's almost like trench warfare. We know trench warfare was bad, but what else right. was going on in World right. War I at the time? Right. So having this at that that micro level is it's unbelievable. I love it. And I, I drop in because I want people not only to enjoy a story, but also to learn something, to learn something about history, particularly about World War II. For example, I put this in all of my books. Most people don't realize the Wehrmacht, the German military, hated the Nazis, hated them. The Nazis were a political party. And Hitler basically armed a group of thugs and, and gave them uniforms and, and they became the SS. Th those were not professional soldiers. Those were thugs. And so the professionals, the, 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 the honorable people like Rommel, for example, um, who were all like our West Point guys, they were professionals. And they, there was a code of conduct going back to von Clausewitz and the Prussian history. Um, and so they despised the Nazis. So you have all this friction um, between the two. In fact, in Codename Lease, they almost went to, to battle um where ss guards ss was nazi party too uh where the ss guards are holding german some german soldiers that fell out of favor with hitler as well as a bunch of other people and one of the colonels that had been arrested stops at a post office when they were when they were there for a break and calls general kesselring's office and says Get your get some men over here and save us from the SS. Save us from the SS soldiers. And so you have, and and they did. So the 14th Army sends a group, you know, the posse comes, the cavalry comes to rescue this group of people, which was mostly British uh, intelligence agents officers that have been captured and some political figures that have been arrested, and then a couple of uh, German officers that have been arrested. And so you have the, the, the German army coming in to save allied people, essentially, from being executed by the SS. And there was going to be a gun battle. And, and the colonel, in particular, Colonel Bonin was his name. He told the SS guards, oh, by the way, I made a call. The 14th Army is you know, one of their, one of their uh, whatever um, companies is going to be here in six hours. So you guys may want to split dodge here because if they catch you and so they did so all of the ss soldiers split and just disappeared because the germ the, uh, the, the you know the, the non-nazi germans were coming so, and most people don't know that so i have to put in the book um about in fact somebody put this highlighted it i think for in a review with the watchmaker's daughter the, the the wehrmacht tried countless times to assassinate hitler or arrest him and that's why Rommel was executed. Rommel was forced to take poison because he was part of it. All, all of the top German military tried to get rid of Hitler by execution, by arrest and trial. Rommel wanted to arrest him and try him. And almost no Americans know this. People in Holland know it, but Americans don't know it. So that's, you'll see in my end notes, I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, or footnotes, I have a lot of big footnotes that, that explain some of that. The general's plot was huge, 38 it's crazy, but the, everybody knows about the July 2044 push where they tried to kill Hitler, which Tom Cruise, you know, was in the movie Valkyrie. Well, th those were all Wehrmacht people. Those were all actual German professional soldiers that were all involved, like Klaus, Klaus von Clausewitz or uh, von Steffenberg. And when the Gestapo found out and started torturing people, to give up names, one name led to another, one name led to another, and, and a lot of the generals already knew I'm dead. So the what happens with that is when the Gestapo is done, 5,000 German officers were either executed or committed suicide, including 12 generals and three field marshals, including Rommel. And Americans don't know that. I mean, you don't get that history watching. No. D-Day or the Longest Yard or Saving Private Ryan, but those were heroes. Those were heroes that, that that gave their lives trying to get rid of Hitler because they knew they saw after a while they saw you know he was a madman, and so 
12 generals and three field marshals gave their lives to get rid of him. And so I have to, so you'll see there, there'll be footnotes, you know, throughout uh, about things like that. I can't put it in the main text. It doesn't pertain particularly to the 10 booms, but it ha I give the dates when something happened uh, because I have to follow a calendar. And while one thing's going on at the Bay A in their house, well, there might be something going on in Amsterdam. Uh, I put in there, the SOE was dropping agents into uh, into the Netherlands. And lo and behold, the agents that they were dropping, the, the, the SOE didn't know, Home Office in London didn't know, oh, by the way, Colonel Giscus of the Abwar basically turned your radio. And so all those people were parachuting into German arms, into German soldier arms. So there's all that stuff that, that's, that happened that people don't know about, and I have to splice it in. And Frank, I have to splice in because yeah. he was in Amsterdam. Audrey Hepburn, most people don't know that Audrey Hepburn was in Arnhem. And so she wrote about, saw some of this stuff. So I have to splice in Audrey Hepburn. So I have to put in all of these different things that all happened so that we get a big picture of what, what that whole time was like there. Thank you, Microsoft back. Excel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about this. Everybody, the watchmaker daughter is out now. Emma, you have any follow-up questions, anything? No, I just want to say, I have to applaud you. Has ever, history is great. We all know it, but it can be dry. So yeah. the, the way you put it together, the way you make it visceral, you can feel it. I mean, it, it has that thriller edge to it, but it makes it real. Kind of like Jason said, boots on ground. Thank you. Yeah, I think most people like reading a story. I mean, for example, if you said, well, what's the what's the best single book about World War II? Well, the standard is William Shire's book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Um, but it's dry. I mean, you're reading, you know, it's this thick and you're reading a history book. And so most people don't want to read it. They want a story. And so if you can grab a story and then embellish and put around the edges the history and some of the other things that were happening, it won't spoil the story. And, and that's a, a call I have to make with every book is I can't slow the pace down because I want a thriller. I can't slow the pace down by having an info dump here. I've got to put it in an either in a footnote or an end note. So that's what I do all the time is if, if there's good history stuff, it's going in a footnote or it's going in an end note. I'm not putting it in the main text because it'll slow it down. Bravo, sir. I, I, I'm sold. I'm a fan. <laughs> Sam here, Larry. There, there, there will be a test next week for both of you. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa. Give me, at whoa, least, whoa. Give me two <laughs> yeah. weeks. Come on. <laughs> two weeks. Okay, we'll give you two weeks. Thank you so much for coming on, Larry. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.